which uh, we prevailed. Uh, the flood 11 were shown to, to be successful in court. So sometimes people, there, there's, there's this sort of tipping point. Of, at what point will activism become mainstream? At what point will enough of those who are in a position to affect greater change, i.e. who are uh, privileged enough to be in this world and close enough to have these connections. So I wanted to ask some of you uh, uh, what, whether you can think of ways to uh, create ra basically radical cooperation. I was at this conference last week at Omega. I brought up no logo. Uh, this changes everything. I was like part of this little moment where they were basically calling for direct action. It needs to become mainstream. The time is now. So for us to be able to uh, sort of wed, basically there's this old operating system of we can reduce everything to, you know, this old myth of we're over nature and we can convert it and there's no loss there. How do we re-enchant one another? How do we act as one human family? How do we both, uh, there's, there's sort of a guilt complex. There's, a, there's, there's a justice conversations here and sustainability conversations here and more and more we're seeing ways to have those conversations together. So. Um, in so much as there's this massive outreach campaign that's needed for Bernie Sanders to be successful, for some of the solutions that are known, the, like the, this, this proposal Tony mentioned is years old, but people are acting like it's not in the news, so it doesn't mean me. Well, I, anyone who didn't go to Occupy Wall Street didn't see that the human possible, what you're going to be able to do in Paris is show the human possible. The solutions are known. Uh, oh, you know, so I just wanted to see um, basically what's that next ev evolutionary step for the messaging so that we're not just spinning our wheels in rooms where people already sort of know, but what, what's that next step and how, how do we act that way? Yeah, I think what you bring up is really important, looking at the split often between a justice framework and environmentalism, and that is, that is longstanding and real. For a lot of my involvement in the environmental movement, there was a lot of racism in the environmental movement and a division between looking at at the needs for you know disenfranchised people versus the environment. So you had people sort of coming up with solutions that had nothing to do with economic inequality and racial inequality. And I think that that's shifting now. And I think it's a large part because of these social movements that are saying actually no, we're not going to have a brighter future just for you know people who are <coughs> largely white and wealthy. We need to be looking at a, at a future that all of us can can survive in. And I think that the conference you went in Omega, that was a historic moment for Omega. And it was really you know, heartening and I was really proud to have a local institution like Omega that was really putting um, in, the, in the front youth of color. You know, the folks from Kite's Nest, from Hudson, the youth ended that conference with poems and with, with um, statements around justice. And that's a very different position than we were in 15 years ago. So I actually feel a lot of hope I feel a lot of hope seeing these movements coming together and people really waking up and, and taking you know, a courageous step towards looking at how our own privilege plays into the, the dehumanization and destruction of, of, of people on the planet. Absolutely. Um, I would just like to say two things from my, to respond to my perspective, which is one is um, you know, act, start locally um, the global is so important, but it's also important to be, to do local, local examples of, you know, in your own communities, um, which also sometimes can be less overwhelming. Mm -hmm. um, and then also, um, we should all be watching our diets and how our diets uh, affect um, climate. Can you say more about that specifically? Um, well, I, th I think there's, uh, like factory farmed meats are a huge impact, they, they rival fracking as far as um, impact on, on the climate. Um, so for me, watching this, I feel a lot of shame. I don't know about anybody else, but I feel super ashamed of the new sneakers that I bought. I feel really ashamed of eating a banana that was flown in from Ecuador. I feel like a lot of shame that comes up for me. And so shame feels really paralyzing to me at times and then also feels really distracting to me. And then I get then like I'm led to this place of, I should only eat apples right now because it's apple season. And I think that that's absolutely a component of it. And I think that also being able to, um, to hold both your, um, your actions, but also how, um, you know, that also 
whether or not you bring a paper bag to, or a, a, whether you're using a plastic bag at the grocery store, that that is not all on you and is not all on us and that actually climate change is an issue that is, that is being disproportionately created by corporations as we've seen. Um, and so to me, it is really interesting that you ended your question with what's the evolution because I think actually getting out of that mindset of evolution, of continually growing, right? And that that's so much about that capitalist drive is that we have to grow, we need to be more, we need to be bigger and better. And I think actually stopping to recognize what we have. And I'm really continually moved by pieces like this where you see people not arguing or fighting for more, but for fighting for what they have. And that to me is a really valuable lesson and something that I carry of that what we, a lot of what we have for many of us who are privileged is enough and so how do we actually break with that mindset of where's the growth um so to me it all comes down to really a shift in values that accompanies also um really intentional action that we take with each other and then also that we take um in resistance to corporations thank you thanks everyone thank